As an emeritus professor of criminology, I've studied and written about every single serial murder case in the United Kingdom. And one case continues to intrigue me. A series of murders known as the Hammersmith Nude Murders. This is the biggest unsolved serial murder case in British criminal history, with a killer who's even more prolific than Jack the Ripper. The murders all took place while swinging 60s London was being hailed as the world's most fashionably vibrant capital. Yet a darker, more terrifying reality was unfolding on the streets. A serial killer was at large, and he sadistically murdered six women. Well, I found this uh, body, and uh, just see the legs, where well, the bottom of the legs were the feet. The killer abducted his victims from what was then the red light district around Shepherd's Bush in West London. He then proceeded to strangle them, strip them, and remove their teeth. Amongst those watching this program, there may be one of you at least who knows or strongly suspects the person responsible. His grim spree sparked one of the biggest police manhunts in history, yet the killer was never caught. Lots of people put forward different theories about the identity of the killer, but frankly, only one really stands out. And if we could prove this theory, it has every possibility of delivering to the Metropolitan Police something that they didn't have 50 years ago. And that's a genuine prime suspect. Living in the epicentre of the murders was a man who went unnoticed by detectives. A man who, as a boy, had killed two young girls in the quiet Welsh town of Abertillery. Their deaths have eerie parallels with the Jack the Stripper killings. In an extraordinary series of interviews, I'm going to speak to the daughter of this double child killer to see if she can shed light on a possible connection between her father and the Hammersmith nude murders. I couldn't believe it. My dad hasn't killed anybody. The man that I knew as my dad was a murderer. All I want are some answers to an enduring mystery. Answers, moreover, that might take us one step forward to identifying the man that the press called Jack the Stripper. Hannah Tailford's body, naked except for stockings and underclothes stuffed into her mouth, was found in the river. In April, the river cast up at Chiswick the nude, tattooed body of Irene Lockwood. She had not been dead for very long. The same month, a mile from the river, another tattooed prostitute, Helen Bartlemy, was found in Brentford. Acton again, July. Mary Fleming's body was dumped in a cul-de-sac. In the night, neighbours heard a car stop, reverse and roar away in panic. Four months later, the tattooed body of Francis Brown was found in a car park. In the murder room at Shepherd's Bush, police have checked every date. But they have found enough similarities to convince them that the killings are the work of one man. I remember watching this on the news as a child and it really captured my imagination about the kind of person who'd be able to do this. At the time, the press kept comparing the killer to Jack the Ripper, but for me, that was in the distant past, and therefore Jack the Stripper seemed much worse, more sadistic, more calculating. And of course, like Jack the Ripper, he evaded capture. As a criminologist, I'm always interested in a serial killer's MO, his modus operandi. And the Jack the Stripper murders have a number of common factors, which really intrigue me. All of his victims were sex workers. They were all diminutive in height. They had been stripped naked and had their teeth removed. 
and the bodies had been stored for some time before being deposited across West London. This wasn't a London that we would recognise today. Back in the 1960s, some parts of West London were a real rough and ready type of place with lots of women selling sexual services and men curb crawling seeking to buy those sexual services. It was a pretty grim and desperate lifestyle and of course some of the women were beaten, were robbed and of course for six women they would be picked up and go into a car with a man who would eventually kill them. Back in the 1960s, the press diminished the crimes and the women, choosing to concentrate on the more salacious aspects of their lives and their work so as to degrade them. Many of their children are still alive today and they're still searching for justice. Victim number one, Hannah Tailford a 30-year-old prostitute who originally came from Northumberland. On February the 2nd, 1964, her body was fished out of the Thames at Hammersmith. Hannah Tareford was my birth mother. Uh, she had me in Exeter prison in July 1957. I remember seeing a newspaper article and the headlines were Fun Time Girl Found in the Thames. So the general attitude towards them was, well, it's just a prostitute. It was a cheap life. So they would just see her as another trollop that was in the cafe having a coffee or in the pub having the, the beer, trying to, tr trying to pull for the night. At the end of the day, she, whatever happened, she was a mum. And she did as best as she could in the, in the situation that she found herself. Justice wasn't done at the time. I'd like them to open the case, find the evidence, maybe come up with closure and say, actually, it could have been this person here. Because the children that are out there, of all the, women, all the mums that were murdered, you know, most of them had children and were still alive. And it would just give us proper, OK, justice has been done. You, you've named that person. The Metropolitan Police mounted what still remains as one of the biggest manhunts in its history. Hundreds of officers were drafted in to hunt down the killer. But this huge combined effort came to nothing, forcing them to turn to new innovative means of getting the public and the killer's attention. Amongst those watching this program, there may be one of you at least who knows or strongly suspects the person responsible. If so, I'm speaking directly and personally to you. There could rest on your conscience the possible death of yet another young woman. I appeal to you to come forward and I can assure the utmost confidence and discretion to anything disclosed. In one final desperate effort, they conducted tens of thousands of door-to-door -door inquiries across London. One door within this search area, which they very likely did not knock upon, was the home of an unassuming family man. But he was also a man who kept until his death a terribly dark secret from all who knew him including his own family. For in his youth, he'd been imprisoned for murdering two young schoolgirls in the most brutal and sadistic way imaginable. And he was living at the epicentre of the Jack the Stripper murders. The first question I'm looking to answer is how could such a man have escaped even being questioned? And could he have gone on to kill and kill again? And that man's name is Harold Jones. Harold Jones hailed from the Welsh mining town of Abertillery. He sadistically murdered two girls in 1921. 
I believe by revisiting and deconstructing their deaths at the hands of Jones, we have the precise starting point for discovering if he could have matured into a serial killer later in his life. The crimes, though almost a hundred years old, continue to be felt by the community and family members even to this day. Visiting the girls' graves today are their nieces, Sue Lloyd and Shirley Swift. But it is so pretty. It's so pretty. I love, love the, is it like a, she hold, what's she holding a rose or something, I would imagine, is, is she in her hand? And the dress that she's wearing is, uh, is what they used to wear then, yeah. you know, those sort of clothes. Eight-year-old Frida Bonnell had gone to a local shop running an errand for her father. She disappeared only to be found dead in a back alley a day later. They must have been absolutely devastated. I know it has affected my family throughout my life. You can't quantify it, can you? Because it was so unexpected and certainly not in a community as the way that I, I have seen Abertillery over the years that protects its own. So this to happen then must have been earth shattering. Buried a short distance from Frida is her friend, Florence Little. The 11 year old was murdered after Frida Bunnell had been laid to rest. Florence's murder devastated Sue's family, which was torn apart by the tragedy. And Florence's parents were buried with their murdered daughter. Excuse me a minute. She's not on her own. She's got her mum and her dad. I mean, it might be sentimental. But they're there with her, trying to protect her now the way they couldn't on that particular occasion. The twin murders devastated the community and made headlines all over the world. Local people were convinced the killer must be an outsider, but the arrival of detectives from Scotland Yard found the answer much closer to home in the form of 15-year-old shop assistant Harold Jones, the last person to have seen both girls before they disappeared. Could Harold Jones really have gone on to become Jack the Stripper? Local historian Neil Milkins certainly believes so, having researched the story and lived in the town where the killer's spectre still looms large. It's a part of the history of Abertillery, you can't get away from that. It's the murder of two little girls um, which astounded the community then, and it's still a sensitive subject, although 97 years have passed. Harold Jones served 20 years in prison for his crimes, but Neil's interest in Jones didn't end with his imprisonment. He was let out of prison in 1941 against the recommendations of a, a number of um, professional people within the prison service. He told the prison authorities, I do not want to lose the desire to kill. And that was shortly before he re was released. I was convinced, absolutely convinced, that Harold Jones didn't come out of prison and settle down and, and lead, lead a normal life. He discovered that after leaving prison, Harold Jones moved to London and lived at the heart of Jack the Stripper's hunting ground. What's more, he discovered that Jones lived only a few streets away from two of the victims' homes. But then Neil hit a brick wall. Frustrated by his inability to get anywhere further with this theory that Harold Jones may have committed the Hammersmith nude murders, Neil remembered my own long-standing interest in the story. Received 1.58 p.m. on the 6th of September. Hello, uh, a message for Professor David Wilson. Um, hello, David, it's Neil Milkins here. I've been doing more research on Harold Jones than I believe he's committed other crimes. Would you be interested in looking into it further? Um, 
catch you soon, David. Thanks for your time. Bye-bye. I got Neil's call, so I'm on my way to Abitaleri to really test his theory. I'm going to try and identify Harold Jones's signature as a killer and see if this can be compared to Jack the Stripper's. And you know, we can approach this like an old fashioned case, looking for new leads, testing for the evidence that exists. But one of the things I'm aware about in relation to this case is that there's absolutely no DNA evidence that survived. So we're going to have to look at this also as if it's a 21st century cold case. And to do that, I need to gather a team around me, most obviously a forensic psychologist, a pathologist, and perhaps most importantly of all, a great detective investigator. I received this um, message from Professor David Wilson, the criminologist, to see whether I'd be interested in helping him as an ex-detective investigator in the case of Harold Jones and whether there was any linkage to the Hammersmith nude murders of the 1960s. Immediately, you know, looking at the case of Harold Jones, I went, I could feel myself going into that obsessive detective mode. And there may be a connection, and there may not be a connection. It's always the search for truth in a police investigation. And I have to start that search in the town of Abitaleri. Jackie and I have set up an incident room in Abitaleri town centre. From here, we'll examine the two murders we know were committed by Harold Jones. We're supported by a group of local people with backgrounds in research and policing. Jackie, you've been in charge of many incident rooms in your career. What do they do? How are they organised? Well, murder is the most serious crime that any detective can investigate. It is the search for truth. The incident room is the hub. The crime will be detected from the incident room. It is an intelligent cell and every bit of information that you gather comes back to the incident room. The first question is, who? Who was the victim? Why was she murdered? Where was she murdered? What happened when she was murdered and how. One of the locals is Lisa Bevan, a forensic science graduate. Other team members are world leaders in their respected fields. There's Professor Mike Berry, a clinical forensic psychologist who works as an offender profiler for the police on serial murder cases. Bernard Knight is one of the Home Office's most pre-eminent pathologists. He worked on some of the biggest murder cases, including that of Fred and Rose West. We know who was killed and we know who killed her. We know that was done by Harold Jones. I'd like us to get out and actually look at the streets around Abitaleri to see if we can build up a picture in relation to how Abitaleri fits in or doesn't fit in with what happens in London. Okay, let's go. The town's layout has remained remarkably intact. This means the team are virtually able to walk in the footsteps of Harold Jones and that of his first victim, eight-year-old Frida Bonnell. The last day of Frida's life began with her running an errand to Mortimer's general store and grain merchants, where 15-year-old Harold worked as a shop boy. He was a nice young boy, he was polite. School teachers said they couldn't find no fault in him. His uh, neighbours, everyone painted him as an angel. Around 9.10 a.m. on Saturday, February 5th, 1921, Frida Bonnell was asked to go on an errand She'd gone into the seed store, but he told her that he said, if you go to the seed storage shed, which is 400 yards away, he said, I can give you that grit. We have got none in the shop. With Harold's employer, Mr. Mortimer, busy elsewhere in the shop, 
Harold Jones saw an opportunity to leave the shop unnoticed. He followed Frida. Harold Jones, uh, we now know, cunningly stayed quite a distance from her so that nobody could say that he'd seen her anywhere near him. He invited her into the shed, he pointed out the bag of grit, and he apparently attempted to rape her, strangled her, bludgeoned her, and did suffocate her with a scarf and left her for dead in the shed. The team arrive at the site where the seed store once stood. By trying to rebuild a picture of the crime, they're looking to see if there is what criminologists call a signature to it. A signature being something unique about the killer's style and the method of murder that acts as a form of deadly calling card. What do we know about what actually happened to her in the seed store? Lisa, have you got the report? Uh, well, I've got the death certificate. And what does the death certificate say? Well, it says that the cause of her death was shock consistent upon rape or attempted rape and injuries to the vulva and hymen, injuries to the neck and partial strangulation, injuries to the forehead and um, shock and fright. So, Bernard, is she hit on the head as a way of stunning her to gain control over her? Well, that's the impression you get. It's the final episode, isn't it? The final part of this is being suffocated. Would the rape have been pre- or post-mortem? Again, you can't tell from this. I mean, these examinations are very superficial. Um, you couldn't tell, really, but... Certainly it could be either, or it could be what's called perimortal, in other words, at the time of death, but a minute or two before, a minute or two after. So, you know, it's impossible to be clear-cut. Jackie, the other thing that strikes me about this is that he has enticed her to the store. Um, he hasn't been seen walking with her to the store. Again, what does that imply for you about the kind of offender we're dealing with? He's had the foresight to say you walk ahead and I'll follow you and it appears she walks ahead to the store and he said I'll meet you there. Constantly thinking about what happens when if I get caught or what happens when the police investigate. Constantly thinking ahead of the game. Very sophisticated and intelligent. When Frida didn't return home her parents raised the alarm. Under cover of darkness, Harold Jones moved Frida's body from the seed store and dumped it in the lane on Duke's Hill, where she was discovered the next morning. A local surgeon performed an autopsy on the young girl on a kitchen table as the distraught family looked on. Scotland Yard detectives were drafted in to help with the search. It was about a week later that someone had said to the police, do you know that Mortimer has got a storage shed. And when they searched our shed, they realised that was the murder scene because they'd found an handkerchief of Frida's on the floor that had come out of her pocket while she was being assaulted by Jones. Much to the outcry of the locals, Scotland Yard arrested Harold Jones for the murder of Frida Burnell. They took him into custody, they charged him, and he was protesting his innocence to them and in the court. I know it was all black against me, but I didn't do it. The trial of Harold Jones made headlines all over the world, but the prosecution's case was dealt a blow when one man was called to give evidence. That man was Herbert Henry Mortimer, Harold Jones's employer. The Mortimers believed the police were setting up Harold Jones for a murder that he didn't commit, and they were so convinced they were prepared to lie to the police and in court um, regarding Arlo Jones's movements. Mr Mortimer's testimony was enough to swear the jury and save Jones from jail. He was found innocent of the crime, much to the delight of the people of Abertillery. A lot of the newspapers reported on it because it was quite a big thing and he was uh, treated like a hero and he acted like he was a hero. Flags bent in and he was carried shoulder right through Abbot Leary and presented with a, a gold watch.
However, not everyone gave Harold Jones a hero's welcome. Frida Bunnell's school friend was a girl called Florence Little. Florence lived just a few doors down from Harold Jones on Darren Road. She was seen openly accusing Jones of murder. Harold, we now know, invited Florence to go into the house with a promise of a drink of pop. Just like Frida, Joan sadistically murdered Florence. Once again, the little girl was strangled and sexually violated and in a final act of cruelty, he slit her throat and drained her body of its blood. Harold Jones had once again been the last person to see the missing child alive. And this time, police weren't prepared to believe his story and immediately searched his house. When they went to the top of the stairs, PC Cox noticed near the arch to the attic that there was, uh, the wall had been cleaned and uh, they realised then that that's, there's some reason why that wall had been cleaned. PC Cox climbed up into the attic and he said, I found the body. <whistles> Harold's father was told by the police the body was in there. He approached his son and he said, Harold, the body's been found in the attic. And he protested, Dad, I don't know nothing about it. I swear I don't know anything about it. And Harold's father said to him, well, it's either you or me, son, and God knows I didn't kill her. Florence's body was removed from the house. Mrs Ada Minnie Lewis is one of Abitaleri's oldest residents and amazingly can still recall events surrounding Florence's demise. They found a second little girl that he murdered in the attic. Oh, the funeral was immense. Cram, jam, full, you couldn't get another person in there. I mean, they, they did pay him tribute to the extent, you know, that everywhere was full. Harold Jones was once again brought before the court on the charge of murder. Once again, he denied everything. I didn't do it, he said. And like I said, he was at a child's court. So they couldn't put him through what they'd put an adult through. Indeed, it was the fact that Harold Jones was still a child when he committed the murders that saved him from an appointment with the hangman. Despite calls for his execution, being 15 meant his life was spared. In search of a more lenient sentence, Harold Jones confessed to the murders. But such was the gravity of the crimes, he was detained at His Majesty's pleasure for taking the lives of Frida and Florence. Even though the murders happened in 1921, I believe the attic of Jones's home still holds a crucial clue about his continued evolution as a murderer. Gosh, this is the actual attic where he hides the body of Flora. Come up, Mike, come up. Oh, 20s. my gosh. I thought it was going to be a, a small space, but it's really a big one. I've worked with uh, killers who kept bodies because they enjoyed the power that they were even able to express over the victim once the victim had died. But I think he's progressed as a killer. I think he's learned from the first murder. Yes. And who's to say that that progression doesn't continue in the years and decades to come. Oh, we, we, yes, we both would agree that uh, the killers get better with age, with time. And as you get older, you're less impulsive, you're better planner. People who go on to kill repeatedly develop methods of murder and fixations with their victims. Those who are most sadistic find a safe place to store the body so as to prolong their warped pleasure even after death. Jones stored both his victims. Those who are most ritualistic take trophies such as personal effects or even parts of the anatomy so they can carry a part of their victim with them at all times. 
Already, I detect such sadism and ritualism in Harold Jones. When Jones was arrested, he was found with seven ladies' handkerchiefs in his pockets. In my experience, handkerchiefs often excite those serial killers who are aroused with the sensations of smell and taste. I suspect some belonged to his victims, the others to girls he had coveted. More disturbingly, I believe this fascination was rapidly developing into something more sadistic, as was recorded in a letter between Jones and his teenage sweetheart, Lena Mortimer. You know, when you asked me to spit in your mouth, dear, really, I don't believe I will ever be as dirty as that. So please forgive me for saying so, for you really did offend me then. A pattern can be seen emerging in Harold Jones's sexual behaviour. For me, the oral fixation is in itself an act of sadism, and in my experience with serial killers, such a pattern of behaviour can only continue to be satisfied if it escalates into something even more extreme. The team regroup back at the incident room in Ebenezer Chapel. What have we learned about Harold Jones and the two murders in Abitaleri? First thing for me is the geography of the crimes and where he disposes of the bodies. There was something about walking those crime scenes that was quite important. What did you make of it? Well, I think Abitaleri must have been a very, very safe town in 1921. Everybody knows each other, and he would know that he would have been seen, had he worked with, walked with Frieda Bunnell, that he said, oh yes, I saw Harold Jones walking with Frieda Bunnell. But he was sophisticated for a 15-year-old to say, you walk ahead, I'll follow to the store, creating a distance, creating a distance for witnesses not to see them together. He was killing in plain sight. The day has given the team a valuable insight into Harold Jones, the boy killer. They now have a clear picture of his signature as a murderer. He is violent and sexually motivated. His victims are much smaller so that he can dominate them. He applied cunning and planning to his crimes. He stored his victims' bodies. He took trophies and he appeared to have an oral fixation. Our task as a team is to see if this cold, calculating and cunning killer in Abitaleri re-emerges in the 1960s as Jack the Stripper. Our next stop is London. Starting on the banks of the Thames in 1964, Scotland Yard were about to find themselves dealing with a killer, the likes of whom they'd not met since Jack the Ripper. The Jack the Stripper murders have never been subject to a full investigation with a team with modern policing techniques. The hope is that by revisiting the decades-old case, they can discover previously unknown clues about the killer's modus operandi and his signature, and see if any of these match with those of Harold Jones as a murderer. When Professor Mike Berry works for the police as an offender profiler, he begins the process by building a mental picture of a killer's movement and behavioural patterns. One of the first things he does is to revisit the locations where the victims were found. Today, he's assisted by journalist Robin Jarossi, who has written extensively about these crimes. This is the sort of Chiswick area we're coming down towards Hammersmith. Um, I think back then, um, certainly up that way a bit more. It was much more of a working area with, with factories, wharves, all that's now gone. Um, but this is the scene where the first two bodies were discovered. Hannah Telford, the first victim, was found here by the river. I suspect he lived nearby, he knew the area very well and it's occurred to him that this would be a great spot to just come down here late at night, reverse up to the river edge and let them go and uh, 
let the river do its job in, in washing away any evidence that may have been left behind. One of the things I found with, with serial killers is they do take trophies and it's not the obvious things, yeah. you know, it can be something that's connected to the victim but of meaningless value to anybody else. Any hopes that the murder of Hannah was an isolated incident were dashed when over two months later, the naked body of 26-year-old Irene Lockwood was also washed up. Can you tell me a bit more about Irene Lockwood? Yes, she'd come down from Nottinghamshire as a young woman. Um, she very quickly picked up some, a, a lot of uh, convictions for prostitution. She'd gone to a pub in Chiswick. The landlord there positively identified her as having been in, in, in the pub. And then she, the very next day, I think, was found by a police patrol. As the tide was going out, she'd been stranded on the foreshore. Uh, she was obviously unclothed. The River Visit is offering Mike an invaluable insight into the dark mind of Jack the Stripper. This killer knows the area very well. It's a, at the time, it would have been quite an industrial area. It would have been dark at night. Uh, there have not been many people. It was in the middle of winter, being cold, wet, miserable. So he would be able to come here and then dispose of the body, knowing that he's unlikely to be seen by anybody. One of the things that we, we know is that people escalate. Serial killers get better and better. Most people do not think about disposal. This man has planned where he's going to dispose of the bodies. To actually leave a body the way that the killers left these bodies makes me wonder whether he's done something before. Following the discovery of Irene Lockwood's body, an increased police presence was to be found along the river. But any hopes the authorities had in deterring the killer from killing again were dashed when another body turned up, this time not in the river, but in a suburban alley near Swincombe Avenue, Brentford, three miles to the west of Chiswick. The victim this time was 22-year-old Helen Bartholomew from Blackpool. She was my sister. Um, I only knew her up until the age of about 10, uh, but I always remember her fondly because she was such a good sister. I remember in Blackpool, she took me up and down the seafront in a Zodiac with the top down, and she had like a rock and roll dress on, you know, with spots on, and she had a lovely smile, and she always had her hair usually up, whenever I saw her, she used to have it in like a, one of these rock and roll beehives, they called them. And she was beautiful. She was, you know, she, she's a beautiful sister, really. The first I heard of Helen being in London was when my brother told me that she'd been murdered. For Helen to be portrayed the way she was, I think, was disgraceful. Because the woman that the papers described bore no resemblance to the person I knew. Because they were all people. They're all somebody's mothers and daughters. There's actually no facts came that, that have, to my mind, that have been produced about Helen's murder, apart from the fact that she was found strangled naked and dead and her teeth removed at the front. And that's the only facts that I've ever been able to find out. The post-mortem of Helen took place over 50 years ago. The team have obtained a copy of the post-mortem report and digitally recreated an autopsy using a system called Anatomage. What did the post-mortem say about her, Lisa? Right, body found naked, death from asphyxia due to strangulation, probably due to twisted clothing around her neck. The post-mortems of all the women reveal they had all lost teeth, and while some may have been due to decay, it's clear in the reports that others had been removed after death. I believe the killer had a fascination with the mouth and that he kept the teeth as trophies along with the clothing he stripped from his victims' bodies. And Lisa, this is interesting because this body is, has not been placed in water and therefore that allows us to get a bit more information. What other information do we well, have? Well, actually, this is the first lady that we had some forensic evidence found. Um, she had flecks of paint f found on her body, um, um, paint that was used in automobile manufacturing at the time. 
paint flecks found on Helen's body offered the police their first real clue. Given that Helen's body was dumped several days after she'd last been alive, police now believe her dead body may have been stored after her murder. As a criminologist, I always feel that if they're uh, storing the body, it gives them greater amounts of time to be with the victim, and that might satisfy all kinds of sexual needs. The police now had forensic clues gleaned from Helen Bartholomew's body, but before they had a chance to process them, Jack the Stripper struck again. His victim this time was 30-year-old Mary Fleming. Again, the diminutive sex worker had been left naked and had her teeth removed, and there were flecks of paint on her body. But the case was about to have its first breakthrough in the form of an eyewitness. To this day, Peter Murray remains one of the only known people who ever saw the killer. This is the first time he's publicly shared his account of that fateful night. And it's an account which gave the police at the time a compelling piece of evidence about the killer's height. I'd been out with a young lady. I think we'd been to the pictures. Let's say we were on the right-hand side of the road. On the left-hand side, there's a garage setback and there was a couple in there. The girl, I can, I can recall she had dark hair. The man, he had a hat on, it was a, a, a trilby, and he had a cream-type mac. He was disturbing her clothing. I could see his hand on her clothing. I couldn't see his face. The struggle that Peter was witnessing was in fact Mary Fleming fighting for her life at the hands of Jack the Stripper. I've gone to Acton Police and I've given them a statement. I don't think he was that tall because I'm thinking he was about the same size as the woman. The policeman said at the time that um, we probably witnessed the murderer. This new information about the killer's height was useful to police for stop and search purposes, but they were still at a loss as to when the killer would strike again. The stripper's fifth victim was found in a Kensington car park, 21-year-old Frances Brown. Her profile as a victim was almost identical to the previous women. On the night of her death, Frances was seen getting into a car with a curb crawler. Her friend, who was also working the streets that night, provided a police sketch artist with a likeness of the driver. This drawing may now be compared to two pictures we have of Harold Jones. The likeness, to my mind, is uncanny. Several months after the body of Frances Brown was found, a sixth victim was discovered. 29-year-old Bridget O'Hara was found behind a shed on the Heron Industrial Estate in North Acton. Well, I went to the stores here just to get something out of it, you see, some soap. And then coming out, I decided to have a look around the back of the store, uh, the shed itself. Well, I found this uh, body, or so I thought at first. And uh, just see the legs, where the bottom of the legs were the feet. Mm. The killing had all the hallmarks of Jack the Stripper. Teeth had been removed and flecks of paint were found on her naked body. The flecks of paint were now seen as being the most powerful piece of evidence and efforts were multiplied to trace the origins of the paint now found on four of the victims' bodies. The police knew it was from a type of paint used in the automotive industry, but it was also mixed with a unique combination of other fibres and particles. Detectives were now convinced that if they could find the spray paint shop, they could find the killer. A number of police officers were trained to gather paint dust samples and dispatched to every garage paint shop in West London. It was an enormous operation and hundreds of garages were visited before one finally delivered a result. This was the premises of Shaw and Kilburn Automotives on the Heron Industrial Estate in Acton. Detectives were able to eventually discover that the bodies weren't stored in a paint shop. Adjacent to the spray paint garage was a disused electricity transformer shed that was part of the abandoned Napier Aero engine factory. 
ventilation shafts in the spray paint shop had sucked the flecks of paint out into the open where they had settled in the empty building next door. This was where the killer had been storing the bodies. The discovery of the body deposition site still did not bring the police the breakthrough they'd hoped for. But the investigation was being headed by one of Scotland Yard's most senior detectives, John DeRose, known as Four Day Johnny for his reputation at being able to solve any case before the working week was out. DeRose then implemented an enormous stop and search operation across a two mile radius in West London, but not a single bona fide suspect emerged. This was complemented by the questioning of thousands of men in the Acton area, an area where DeRose was convinced the killer either lived or worked and had known that the Napier factory was abandoned and would be the perfect place to hide a body. DeRose eventually put together a list of suspects. The list started off with, I think, 20. It was one of 20 men, we said. It came down to 16, to 12, to 6, to 3, eventually. These suspects were never made public, but those working closely on the case under DeRose were party to this confidential information. Pat O'Connor was one such detective. Was there any indication given to you, Pat, as to where the inquiry was going and any named prime suspects? Yes, there was a name put forward to me personally. And it was a man by the name of Mungo Ireland. And when you say that was given to you personally, this was not in a general briefing, but who gave you the information? Probably somebody that I knew on the squad that knew. A little bit who needs to know gets the information? Yes. So what was your belief about the prime suspect, Mungo Island? This could have been the individual who committed those uh, murders. And what happened to Mungo Island? I believe he committed suicide. But this claim that Mungo Island was the killer was certainly not the official position of the Metropolitan Police. The case then, as now, remains open and unsolved. Rose gives the impression that they pressured him and they'd cornered this guy and he had eventually killed himself. But that didn't happen because the police weren't aware of him and his suicide until four months after the final murder. They discovered that he'd um, been working on the heroin trading estate at that point but they never really came up with any evidence to connect him to any of the victims. There was no forensic evidence. He was never interviewed. And it's clear that the, opera, uh, the police who were in charge of the investigation at that point never really considered him to be a very serious prospect. When one of the victims disappeared, he was in Scotland uh, doing a job there as a cleaner. Now the Met asked Dundee police to check that and the Dundee police came back and said, yes, that's right, we checked with his employers and he was at work that day. The most compelling piece of evidence that the police had were that the same flecks of car paint had been found on four of the victims, meaning they'd been killed by the same man. Mungo Ireland had a watertight alibi for when one of the victims was murdered, which, by a process of elimination, removes him from the frame for all of the killings. John DeRose's identification of Mungo Ireland certainly wasn't based on any hard evidence. It was founded on something far less empirical. No CCTV, no DNA analysis, no mobile phone data. So in the 60s, you really had, apart from... Instinct. Instinct. And doing, gut feeling. And you think gut feeling. Yes. So in this particular case, do you think Mr. DeRose went on gut feeling about Mungo Island? Well, I, I couldn't say that. That's only a pig of mine. I, I've always say he would have weighed up the situation, what evidence was there at this particular time, mm -hmm. and his own conclusions. How long do you think after you found the samples, um, in relation to the murder of Bridget O'Hara, 
and the death of Mungo Island. How long do you think you remained, not just you, but the rest of the detectives, on the inquiry thereafter? We had a get-together. A get-together? Yes, a get-together, an office meeting. And Mr. DeRose was going on holiday. And thereafter, it then petered out, and I returned not long after it was wound down. What was the information that you had given to you about the reason Mungo Island killed those prostitutes? His access of the area and his knowledge of the area surrounding where those bodies were being found are picked up. Any concrete evidence? No. Thank you. By the autumn of 1964, with the incident room beginning to wind down and nobody being charged for the crimes, it would appear that Jack the Stripper really had gotten away with murder. The killer would have taken huge satisfaction knowing that he'd outwitted Scotland Yard's finest. And in a time before DNA evidence, he would have known his secret would have been safe for the rest of his living days. But why did he stop killing? In my experience, serial killers only stop killing when they're caught, become sick, or die. With this in mind, I'm intrigued once again by a detail in the life of Harold Jones. He began to fall ill in the mid-1960s and was later diagnosed with bone cancer. At around this time, the last of the Jack the Stripper murders occurred. If Jones was sat before me now, there are so many questions I would like to ask him about his life in London during that time. But he died in 1971. However, an extraordinary breakthrough has occurred. The production team has traced the next best thing to speaking to Jones himself, his daughter. She's agreed to do an audio interview. This is the first time she has ever spoken publicly about her father. She remains stunned by the revelation that he was a child murderer in Wales, something he hid from her during his life. I couldn't believe it. I thought, my dad hasn't killed anybody. I couldn't believe it. It took me quite a while to, to take it in. The man that I knew as my dad was a murderer. You know? Uh, as I say, to this day, I still can't believe it. She's confronted with the, the reality that he's committed two murders, which is unquestionable. That's a, f a heck of a job for her to cope with. She's got to make the image of her father equate with the memories that she has of her father. And to be fair to her, she's been advised her father has been in jail for killing two little girls an event that she did not understand or know about. Let's listen to a little bit more. Okay. Surely, if he had done these so-called murders, they would have tracked him down. He's not here to be able to say and ask him anything, to find out really. Okay, he admitted to the ones in Wales. But people can change, can't they? So it's not necessarily because he did this, it doesn't mean to say that he's done it again. So because he lived in that area, he must have done them. But did he? Nobody's been able to tell me he did or he didn't. What I'd like to hear is he didn't do them, it wasn't him. But. If he did, I would like to know if he did, but I don't know if we'd ever know why he did. It would be hard, obviously, as you know, to, for you to hear something like that. But it would put closure to things. If somebody said, no, we have proof that it was him that done I would not be it. it would probably hurt a lot. But at least it puts end to things.
Harold Jones the father appears to be a very different man to the boy who went to prison for murder. Prison records often detail an offender's rehabilitation journey. Mike and I have uncovered Harold Jones's prison psychiatric reports and they give us cause for concern. These words are taken from those reports. He states that he attacked the girls to kill them and he denies that the attacks on the girls were actuated or accompanied by any sexual desire. This in the face of the evidence cannot be believed. This psychiatric report clearly demonstrates that Harold Jones's sexual pleasure was derived through the act of violence upon his victims, not through the act of sex, that his state of sexual arousal was achieved through murder. An ejaculation of semen had occurred either before, during or after the attack on Florence and in every probability is connected to that attack. In other words, sadism. The interviewing psychiatrist goes on to highlight his concerns about the letter from Jones's young sweetheart, Lena Mortimer, who's appalled at his request to spit in her mouth. And we should also remember the collection of ladies' handkerchiefs Jones had upon him when he was arrested. He says that Jones denies the lady's pocket handkerchiefs found in his possession had any connection with sexual desires at all, but I do not think this can be believed. His statement to me that he took all the handkerchiefs from Lena because he, he was fond of her is somewhat unconvincing. He's asking Lena to spit in his mouth. The spitting should be regarded as a sadistic manifestation. To put it crudely, if we've got a young man as a teenager who's a sadist, that sadism isn't going to disappear when he's an adult, is it? Mm. It's going to develop. Without any doubt, I would expect it to become more violent, more sexual. I think it shows quite clearly this was a sexual and a violent offender. Jones's psychiatric report reveals him to be an unreformed sexual sadist. The report continues, the aggressiveness of the male is accompanied by that certain pleasure in the manifestation of power over a woman. Also, the sexual act reaches its highest gratification when accompanied by cruelty. And most damning of all, the prisoner, however, shows no remorse for the crimes and no apparent desire for any alteration in his condition. What I find much more worrying is no treatment. Oh. There is absolutely no treatment of this man at all. He's gone in as a, a sex offender, a violent man. He comes out as a sex offender, a violent man. They talk about him being very well behaved because he's institutionalized. He does as he's told within the system. But he makes it very clear that he isn't going to talk to anybody about his offence in any depth. This guy is dangerous because we've done nothing with him. There's nothing in the reports to indicate that he's changed one iota. And therefore, we would not have released him because we would have said the likelihood is this man will kill again. Yeah, and I, I, I think he has the potential to kill and probably would have killed sometime after 1941 when he's released. With no treatment for this sexual sadism, Harold Jones left prison. The authorities didn't keep a close tab on this still dangerous man for one good reason. He was lost in the fog of war. Conscripted in 1941, he served in Libya and stayed in the armed forces for almost five years. Prized engineering skills honed in the prison workshop saw him become a gun fitter. After being demobbed in 1946, Jones headed for London. His army discharge papers highly commended him to any future employer as a fine, skilled engineer. London was the perfect place to get lost and start again, and Jones did just that by taking a new name and a wife. Harold Jones married in 1948, and records show that he used a false name, Stevens, his mother's maiden name. A new baby was soon on the way. Here now was a golden opportunity to totally reinvent himself to erase his deadly history.
but the pull of Harold Jones's dark past would prove too much for him to leave behind because he was about to make an extraordinary pilgrimage back to the scene of his crimes. Mem was in school with the girls, so Mem knew the girls, so obviously uh, Mem had told us about uh, the murders. It was the summer of 1950, and I can remember being a young girl, and, and Mum said about us going up the cemetery to put flowers on Owen Anna and Grancher's grave. So as it was a nice day, we said yes, we'd like to go. So we caught the bus up, and uh, we went up to Anna and Grancher's grave, put some flowers on the grave, and tidied it up, and then we came down because we had to wait for the bus to come back. So I can remember us sitting on the seat, and Mum took some lemonade up because it was a hot day, so um, after we had our pop, it wasn't very long after, Mam said to us, oh, come on, girls, we're going quick. So we went and what was up. Well, she didn't tell us until after we got home that Harold Jones had walked in through the gate. So what he was doing up there that day, I don't know, because his mother and father were still alive at that time, so he wouldn't have gone up to their graves. So perhaps he was going up just to have a look at the girls' graves, just to gloat, I don't know. Jones took a huge risk seeking out Frida Bunnell and Florence Little's graves. For me, this wasn't a mark of a man paying his respects. This was a man seeking a form of communion with the dead. Many killers in history have sought the same kind of pleasure. It gives them power over their victims, even after death. I believe it's this very same need for power over the dead that possessed whoever committed the Hammersmith nude murders, a connection that Mike has also made whilst preparing his profile of Jack the Stripper. What's fascinating me is that he's escalated, so he's actually keeping the bodies. Most people, if they kill, they psychologically and physically want to distance themselves from the victim. The serial killer keeps the victim for pleasure. They want to possess it. You're playing God. That's what they like, being God. We know that he's stripped the bodies and taken all the clothing. Is he dressing up in them? Is he uh, making them wear the clothes after death? And we know from the pathologist's report that clearly um, two of the victims were dressed after death and then stripped. So is he working out some fantasy with them? Mike's profile also shed some light on more fundamental characteristics, including his basic domestic routine. One of the things I found fascinating was all the offences were in the weekdays and they were all after 11 o'clock at night. This indicates that he's got a life on a Saturday Sunday that doesn't give him the freedom to go out and commit offences. This may be he's likely to have had some family commitment once you start looking at organised offences, you can then start saying the killers like to be much older, more mature. In these cases, we can say quite categorically, this was done by an older man. Mike's offender profile helps us build an even better picture of Jack the Stripper. And I'm intrigued by some of the similarities in the profile that match what we now know about Harold Jones. But there are still many unanswered questions, and I believe there's only one person who can answer them. Hello. Hi, Jackie, it's David. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, Jackie. Jackie, I think you and I have got to go and speak to Harold Jones's daughter. There's so much information there that we should be pursuing. Yeah, good idea, absolutely. I mean, she'll be able to help us with where he worked, when he worked in those places. What other information has she got that can f throw some light onto this case? And also, it would be really good to pin down from her a chronological order of the addresses that they lived at so she can remember from a small child up until the point that she left home. Okay, thanks very much, Jackie. Okay, nice to speak to you, bye-bye. Bye. You know, the more I think about it, the more I realise that uh, Jones's daughter is a, a real link back to Jones the man, Jones the killer, potentially 
Jones the serial killer and his daughter might therefore just be the, the key that's going to unlock this entire mystery. I cannot emphasize enough just how generous the daughter and her husband are being in helping us with such a difficult matter. They're also prepared to share her family archive of photos and documents which reveal what Harold Jones looked like whilst he lived in London and also the identity he used. Oh, this is their marriage certificate. See, was Harry Stephen. Yeah, engineer. So I Your dad's quite small in a sense, because you're, how tall are you? <laughs> five foot something. Wasn't really tall. So he's about five foot four then? Yeah. There he is. He's hiding. Yeah, he's behind there. Did he often wear a trilby hat? Towards the end, yeah. don't mm. know why he did. What sort of occupations do you remember him having? Well, he used to be a sheet metal worker. A sheet metal worker? Yeah. And um, where was the sheet metal work? Where, he would, where, where, where would he do the sheet metal work? And where was the That was in Acton. In Acton itself, mm. yeah. Do you know where in Acton it was? No, no. Until you were told of his background, you had no knowledge that your father was Harold Jones? He, I did know his name was Harold Jones, yes, because when we moved to um, Hammersmith, mm -hmm. he used Jones for working. Oh, okay. And I did question that with Mum. What did she say? She said, oh, it's another person's got the same name, so right. that's changed. I always remember that, because I did ask, because I found something with Jones, and I said, who's this? Because right. <laughs> I didn't know. <clears throat> and she said, oh, it's Dad. So I said, well, no, he's got, it's not his right name. And she said, no, she said he had to change his name while he was working. This is a crucial new piece of information. Harold Jones changed his address, job and name at a time that coincides with the discovery of the location where the killer had been storing the bodies in Acton. And just as importantly, given that Jones had worked in Acton, I'm convinced that as an engineer, he would have known about the closure of the Napier Aero Engine Factory, a sprawling, abandoned site. As the conversation about Harold Jones progresses, the daughter remembers another disturbing memory about her father. I know that they had an argument and that just went. Mm -hmm. He would never hit Mum. Mm -hmm. or me, I never got smacked or anything. Mm -hmm. And he would rather walk out the house than to hurt her. Did she know where he'd gone? Yeah. How did she know, do you think? I don't know how she knew, but she used to, she took me with her when he went. So she knew where to find him, but <clears throat> I asked what, how, you, she didn't want to say anything. And he had a kind of a bolt hole yeah. to go to. Yeah, rather if... than, he didn't like to argue, so he would walk out, and that's obviously he found somewhere to go. Can you and remember then, where the bolt hole was? It was in Hammersmith. In Hammersmith itself. Yeah. And do you remember anything about it? It was a It flat. was like one of these hostel places. A hostel. He buggered off and went in that, mm. that DOS house. Mm. You don't know what he was up to while he was in there. Mm. There's no smoke without a fire, is there? You know what I mean? He kept it all them years to himself, which has got to play on your conscience. I don't care who you are. You, you've mm. murdered someone. You, it's something you can't tell your new wife and, and you've had a kid and you can't tell her. It's a hell of a strain on someone. Mm. The thing is, you are not responsible for anything that your father may or may not have done. You don't have to carry any guilt or shame on behalf of him. Mm. Well, I'd like to know the truth. Sure. If that can ever be established. Yeah. Yeah. The bolt hole Harold Jones used to stay in was called Roughton House, a working man's hostel on Shepherd's Bush Road near Hammersmith. Records show that Harold Jones first stayed there after being demobbed. This bolt hole was at the epicentre of the Jack the Stripper murders, and Harold Jones's daughter remembers picking him up from there around that time. Bridget O'Hara, the sixth victim, was last seen close to Roughton House on the day she died. 
She was with a man who had previously been seen drinking with a small group of Welsh men in a local pub. The last sighting of Bridget was walking down the road with this man, who's described as being very short and wearing a trilby hat. We believe this new information about Roughton House is a critical new lead and one Jackie is looking to explore further along with other information we know about where Jones lived and worked. Environment's really important, I think. Understanding and knowing where prostitutes work and frequent in the pubs. That's a real kind of essential part of it. So it's familiar, familiar. I definitely think that the man lived in this area and worked in West London. That's what I believe to be true, that this area was very comfortable for him. Jackie has arranged a talk to Dr. Kim Rosmo. Kim is a geographic profiler, one of the FBI's go-to men in serial murder cases. He helps investigators to create murder maps based on empirical data about where the killer's victims' bodies were found. These maps can suggest links between where the killer lived, worked or socialised. He's created for us one such map for the Jack the Stripper murders. Um, could you just explain what is geographical profiling? Geographic profiling is an investigative tool that's used in serial crime cases. Um, its purpose is to help police focus on the offender's most likely anchor points. Now, that might be their home, it might be some place they start their search from. Um, you know, in some cases, offenders' work is more important than their home. There's been a lot of research on what's called journey to crime. How far does an offender travel from their home or their anchor point to where they offend? As you move further away the from an offender's home, the probability they'll commit a crime drops. The other factor is uh, there tends to be a buffer zone around offender's home because they don't want to operate too close to home. Their car might be recognized. Someone may be a friend or a neighbor and recognize their face. So overall, in a serial case, we'll have a number of locations, each one of them giving a geographic clue, but together providing a pattern that gives us a lot of information. One of the areas was north of Chiswick High Road, um, south of the Vale in the um, Uxbridge Road. It stretches down all the way to Lyric Hammersmith. So the second one, which is to its east, um, focuses kind of around Holland Park, down to Kensington High Street. We're looking at a particular suspect who we know when he was a young man, age 15, murdered two girls on separate occasions. Sometimes later on release, he ended up in an area uh, within one of the hotspots that you identified. Well Based on what you've described, um, he sounds like a good suspect, but you also have to consider both elements to make someone a good suspect and elements that make someone a bad suspect. If this was an active investigation today, these are different angles and theories uh, the investigators would use the geo profile to help explore, to help prioritize their um, their efforts. Thank you so much, Kim. It's been an absolute delight. Nice sure. to see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Kim Rosmo is saying these are good indicators to police. So where we had a big area of 24 miles that John DeRose was looking at, this talks about uh, 1.6 miles and, and uh, one mile, just under three square miles. That's hugely uh, useful tool. This information from Kim also intriguingly marries up with a new piece of information Jackie has found out about the identity of a man who worked at a location within the hotspot. Hello? Hi, David, it's Jackie. Oh, hi, Jackie. How did you get on with Kim Rosmo? Very well indeed, thank you. Um, I did some research about a company called Napier Aero Engines, Acton, and they have a roll call of all their ex-employees. And um, I have a man here in the name of H.L. Stevens, 
who was employed next door to the building where four of the bodies were known to be stored in the transformer shed. This new information about a Mr. H. L. Stevens is fascinating, as we know Jones went by the name Stevens during part of his life, and it's a finding which potentially forms another compelling piece of our puzzle. But pieces remain missing, partly because as civilians, we don't have the powers of the police to obtain certain documents, such as Harold Jones's work records. The last time the Metropolitan Police looked at the case was just over a decade ago. They remained unable to draw any firm conclusions as to the identity of the killer. But Harold Jones wasn't on the police radar when that cold case review was done. If he had been, would that information have changed the outcome of the police's findings? I'm now convinced that we need Jackie to use her contacts at Scotland Yard to get hold of the man who did the review in 2007 and get him to look at what we've found so far. Do you know the, the detective who did that review? I've heard of him, Alan Jackman, a very, very experienced murder squad detective. I can uh, get on and do that for you, David, and come back when I've made contact. OK, Jackie, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Do you know, if we can get Alan Jackman, who conducts the cold case review, as part of our investigation, that really would add some weight to what it is that we've been doing. In particular, you know, it, it's always difficult to get the police to reopen a case, but if we've got the man who conducts the cold case investigation saying, actually, if I had had this evidence when I conducted my cold case review, that seems to me to be really significant. The contents of the 2007 cold case review remain unavailable to the public but Jackie has tracked down Detective Alan Jackerman. Jackie is particularly keen to see if Alan can recall ever seeing a suspect list from the era, and if so, did the name of Harold Jones or Harry Stevens appear on it? We were lucky enough to find um, the original report written by Detective Superintendent Bulldog, within which contained quite a long list of suspects which he looked at at the time, neither the name Jones nor Stevens appeared. So he didn't form a part of the review. I wonder mm. if you would be kind enough to come back with me down to Abitillary in South Wales, where enormous amounts of intelligence and information that I would like to present to you for your examination and look at the work that the team have gathered over the last 10 months. I'd be fascinated. I would love to go look at the evidence that you found against Jones. Thank you. Many months have passed since we began our investigation in Abitoleri, and the time has come to return to the incident room there. Our team have compiled a comprehensive list of all the evidence we've unearthed, and we're about to present this to Detective Alan Jackerman. Alan will consider our findings to see if there's any merit in presenting them to Scotland Yard. Let's start by things like age. One of the things profile suggests that this is an older man because he was organised. And he's organised in a number of different ways. We know that he stripped the bodies and we know that he took trophies specifically of the clothing and the teeth. There's also, I think, some information about height. Robin, what height were the victims? They were all five feet, five feet, two inches tall, so they were very petite women. On uh, the night that the last victim disappeared, one of her drinking companions saw her walking off um, at closing time with a chap that she seemed to have known. Um, and she, he, he was described as being five foot six, wearing a sheepskin jacket and a trilby. A number of the victims were found in a particular area related to a particular trading estate, Alan, weren't they? Yes, the, the Heron Trading Estate, which was quite a large area. 
um, <clears throat> containing lots of factory units and uh, where thousands of people were employed. Our killer has access to the lockup that he's able to use. That might also indicate that our killer was also employed there. So let's bear this profile in mind and think to what extent there's some mirroring in relation to the profile of Jack the Stripper with what we know definitively about Harold Jones. In relation to Frida and Florence's murder, there's evidence of Harold Jones storing the bodies. I'm also interested in this idea of trophy taking. Jack the Stripper's murders are characterized by the taking of trophies, uh, in particular the clothes <coughs> and the teeth. The prison records reveal quite a lot in relation to handkerchiefs and spitting in the mouth. The spitting in the mouth, I think, ties up with the sadism that we see in the Jack the Stripper murders. The idea of the killer's fixation related to the teeth, to the mouth. These women were sadistically murdered. And because of that sadism, which had a sexual overtone, they lost their lives. Sadism doesn't dissipate over time. Sadism always finds some way of expressing itself in terms of the killer's life and lifestyle. So when you start to put these things together, there's an uncanny mirroring of these early murders in the 1920s and how aspects of those murders are reappearing in the murders that we see in the 1960s. And your work in particular, your part of the investigation, Jackie, throws up information in relation to whether or not we can determine was Harold Jones Jack the Stripper? Thank you, David. What I'd like to do is play some excerpts from the interview and you will hear the words of Harold Jones' daughter. She remembers her father leaving home on two occasions for two to three days. She asked her mum, because it troubled the little girl why he'd done it, and her mum said, because he had to get away. This troubled the girl, and when she was older, she asked her mum about it again. And I'd like you to play the next clip, please. I know he had, they had an argument. He wouldn't argue with mum and he'd walk out and he would end up there. But why did he have to go? Why could he not just argue it out with mum like people do? Was he frightened that he might have done something to mum? What do you mean? Was well, he... was he afraid that if he stayed and argued with Mum, he would have killed her? He was very afraid to lose his temper by the sound of everything that's gone on, that he might do something. What is also interesting is that the daughter reveals another name change. All the paperwork, all the paperwork, was in the name of Stevens. So why does he want to change his name back to Jones, having been called Stevens? And might I suggest to you, that's because the name Stevens is even more toxic than Jones. And he's worried that that might mean that people start to investigate this man called Harry Stevens, who might be connected to the Jack the Stripper murders. So I wondered if you, David, would put up on the map Ralston House, on this road here, 221 Hammersmith Road. So within the western hotspot of the Jack the Stripper murders, we've got where Harold Jones disappears to when tensions within the home become too much for him. I mean, this is quite extraordinary, isn't it? This is beginning to look like some empirical evidence based on our profiles and then based on the evidence of what we know about what Harold Jones did and what people said about him when he was incarcerated. 
We're now ready to ask Alan Jackman what he thinks of our findings and if he would be willing to bring any influence he has within the Metropolitan Police to bear in order to get the case reviewed. Now, Alan, you, you and Jackie were police officers. If you suddenly get information suggesting that a convicted double child murderer with the kind of profile of what he does to his victims was living within one of the key areas where the police were investigating a, a sequence of murders, surely for you, for any police investigation, that's pretty important information, isn't it? He would shoot to the top of the suspect list without a doubt. You'd never heard of Harold Jones when you did the first cold case review. If you had heard of Harold Jones with all of this information, how high up your suspect list would he have been? Well, as we know, um, Harold Jones didn't feature in the first inquiry at all. But had I known then what I know now, much further research would have been done on Harold Jones and he would have been in the highest level of suspect. In fact, he would be Harold Jones, a very good prime suspect. Yes. There's lots of things that we do know. There's lots of things that we don't know. But don't we owe to the victim's families who are still living, don't we owe something to them to pursue this a little bit more? Because we've come so far as civilians, the Metropolitan Police can take it further. Alan? There are still avenues to pursue, and I would certainly relish being involved in any further investigation. I'm really grateful to hear that because this is a case where there are still living human beings who are intimately connected to the six women who died. And it seems to me we do have a moral responsibility to those descendants. I think we need to be part of the process that brings justice to the descendants of the six women who were killed by Jack the Stripper. It's almost a hundred years since Harold Jones killed Frida Bunnell and Florence Little. Over the years, their graves had fallen into a state of disrepair. However, the people of Abitaleri have now raised money for the headstones to be repaired, and the graves have now been restored, forming a fitting and enduring tribute to two children who lost their lives, but will never be forgotten. No one who's heard this story can fail to be moved by it. It's a pleasure to be able to remove this cover. I hope that Florence and her family will rest in peace, knowing that we've not forgotten them. <laughs> I just can't speak of it. It's a wonderful to see that. For more real crime investigations, check out BBC iPlayer for an insight into the world of the prosecutors. It's available to watch now.